Apple sort of made a mess with the M2 MacBook Pro and the M2 MacBook Air. You see, just like with the two previous models, we have two very capable laptops, but when we look at the pricing and the features, I'm not sure that the MacBook Pro makes a whole lot of sense, maybe with two exceptions. Now, I bought all of these laptops with my own money, and I'm gonna help you get more by paying less. So both laptops start out with eight gigabytes of unified memory and 256 gigabytes of storage. The M2 MacBook Air starts at $1,200, and the MacBook Pro sells for $1,300. So we're looking at about a hundred dollar difference, not insignificant, but not a lot of separation there. With the M1 model, there was a $300 difference between the two base models and the more expensive MacBook Pro had some better features, but this year it's not quite that simple. So let's take a look at both of these from the perspective of an everyday user. And I'll also add some context for more demanding users. Now both laptops come with the new M2 chips, but there are small differences that I want you to be aware of. The MacBook Air comes with an eight core CPU and an eight core GPU and can be upgraded to a 10 core GPU for an additional $100, which would put it at the exact same price as the MacBook Pro. With the M2 MacBook Pro, you're always getting a 10 core GPU, so the only upgrades are unified memory and storage. For most users, the difference between eight and 10 GPU cores aren't gonna be super meaningful, but if your specific workflow includes GPU intensive tasks, then I think that upgrade makes sense in the long run. Also, I'll show you some interesting benchmarks later on in this video because I wanted to look at sustained performance and the SSD speeds of the various storage options. Now, whether you get the Air or the Pro, you can go up to 24 gigabytes of unified memory, then all the way up to two terabytes of storage. Now, I made other videos about this, but I just wanna make sure to remind you that you cannot upgrade the RAM or the storage later on. So whatever you choose now, is what you'll have for the life of the device. Now, being able to upgrade these to 24 gigabytes is a big deal. With my M1 devices, I can pretty easily use up to 16 gigabytes that I have, so this 50% increase is super welcome, but again, keep in mind that you can do that with both laptops, so it doesn't really give one the edge over the other. Now, in terms of performance, the one notable difference is that the Pro has a fan, where the air does not. Now this means that when you push both of them to the limit, the air will at some point throttle back performance in order to cool down, and the Pro will just be able to turn the fan on and just continue to chug along, but more on this in just a minute. Now, when we look at the form factor, we see some important differences, but they seem to be leaning in favor of the less expensive MacBook Air. We're getting approximately the same width and depth, but the Air is 0.17 inches or 4.3 millimeters thinner. Now, that may not sound like a lot because both of them are quite thin, but it is noticeable. And also, I wanna mention that the Air is 0.3 pounds or 0.16 kilograms lighter. It's not enough to make a major difference as far as portability goes, but it is worth mentioning. And we're also no longer seeing that tapered wedge design on the MacBook Air, and the M2 version kind of looks like a thin 14-inch MacBook Pro. I actually really like the wedge design on the M1 model because it was super comfortable to type on, but the M2 Air is really thin, like the body is really thin, so it doesn't really dig into my wrists like the MacBook Pros do. Now, as far as ports, both laptops get two Thunderbolt 3 slash USB 4 ports, and in both cases, the ports are on the left side. Now, I really wish that they were split one on each side so that it'd be more convenient to connect accessories or to charge the laptops from either direction. And speaking of charging, we're seeing another advantage with the MacBook Air, which now comes with the MagSafe 3 charging port. Now, this means that you can charge the MacBook Air and still have both Thunderbolt ports available for accessories, whereas on the Pro, you will need to use one of the Thunderbolt ports for charging. I also wish that these were Thunderbolt 4 ports and they had the ability to connect multiple external displays. Now, I know that the Air is targeted at a more basic user, but Dual display setups are becoming more and more common and both of these laptops are definitely powerful enough for work and even for more demanding users. Now, even if Apple didn't wanna do that with the MacBook Air, this would have been a real opportunity to differentiate the Pro. Now, as it stands, if you want native support for multiple monitors, then you'll need to look at the 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pro models. Now, finally, both the Air and the Pro have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, with advanced support for high impedance headphones. And neither of them come with an HDMI port or a micro SD card slot. 
both of which are available on the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro. Now moving on to the display, this is another area where the Pro versus the Air doesn't really make a lot of sense because the Air actually has a bigger and better display. We're looking at a 13.6 inch liquid retina display on the Air versus 13.3 retina on the Pro a slightly higher resolution on the Air, the same 500 nits peak brightness. Both are P3 displays, which have a wide color gamut for more accurate color reproduction, and both offer true tone, so they can detect the color of the light in the room and then make adjustments so that white always looks white rather than yellow or blue. Now, ultimately, the Air has smaller bezels and a notch versus a larger forehead on the Pro, and. Having used both, I personally prefer the Air. The keyboard on the M2 Pro is the same as what we had on the M1 model, and it still features Touch ID for biometric authentication. Now, I know that the touch bar is quite polarizing. I like it, but I know a lot of you don't. And if it is something that you like, this may be your last opportunity to get one, at least for a few years until Apple inevitably brings it back. The M2 Air got an upgrade, so now we have a full height row of function keys at the top, and a larger Touch ID button. In both cases, Touch ID has been great, and you can use it for unlocking the device to complete purchases and to access secure documents or system settings, all without needing to enter a password. As far as typing, these are both absolutely fantastic keyboards. And again, I'll give the edge to the Air here because the lower profile body means that the edge is not hitting my wrist and it's more comfortable to type on. But in either case, these are right up there at the top as far as laptop keyboards go. Now the trackpad was also expanded on the Air and it's now essentially the same size as the Pro. And this is an upgrade from the previous model. I definitely appreciate the larger trackpad on the Air now, and Apple probably makes my favorite trackpad on any laptop. When we talked about the display, I mentioned the notch on the MacBook Air, and it's there, of course, to house the new camera system. This is another area where the Air is better with a new 1080p camera versus a 720p camera on the Pro, and here's a sample. Here's a camera and microphone test of the M2 MacBook Air and the M2 MacBook Pro. This should give you a pretty good idea of the type of image quality that you should expect and the type of audio quality that you're going to get. When it comes to speakers, both are very good for a laptop, but once again, the Air gets the win with a four speaker system. Overall, the Air is a little louder, the mids and highs are slightly brighter, and the audio sounds fuller and less tinny. And one advantage that remains with the MacBook Pro is battery life. Now we're getting a 52.6 watt hour battery on the Air versus 58.2 watt hour on the Pro. And overall, the Pro is rated for 20 hours of movie playback versus 18 hours on the Air, then 17 hours of wireless web versus 15 on the Air. Now one other potential difference has to do with charging where the MacBook Pro comes with a 67 watt power adapter. The base model of the MacBook Air comes with a 30 watt power adapter, and then for 20 bucks you can upgrade to a 35 watt dual USB-C adapter or the 67 watt adapter. Personally, the two extra hours of battery life on the MacBook Pro haven't proven to be a significant difference maker for me because both of these last so long. Unless I'm doing really heavy work, I don't even get close to running out of battery with either of these in a single day. And if I'm doing something like editing and rendering videos or running benchmarks, then I'm gonna need to charge both. But having said that, battery life definitely goes to the MacBook Pro, so if that's your top priority, this is definitely the way to go. Now next, I wanted to test CPU, GPU, and SSD performance. Now, since we're getting the same CPU cores with both models, short-term single and multi-core performance is virtually identical. But when we look at GPU performance, we can see a major difference between the eight and 10 core MacBook Air models. Another interesting result came from Cinebench, where as you would expect, single core performance was the same. But look at the difference between the 10 minute multi-core tests. When I ran a 30 minute test, then we can see that the Pro was able to maintain performance and then both the 10 and the eight core options of the MacBook Air had to throttle back performance in order to keep the chip cool. Now, I wanna make sure that I put these in context because I think looking at benchmarks is interesting and it can provide some insight, but unless you're buying a laptop specifically just to run benchmarks, then you should be more interested in real life use. And 
In that context, all three models have been great. But most of the everyday tasks that we perform are single core. So for the majority of things, you're not really going to notice a difference. Now, if you're editing video, working with motion graphics, 3D or visual effects, then you are likely to appreciate things like sustained performance, additional RAM and additional GPU cores. Also, if these types of things are the primary reason why you're getting this laptop, I would highly recommend that you check out the 14 inch MacBook Pro, then check out this video for some insight as to why. For what I did in Premiere Pro and Final Cut and Photoshop and Lightroom, there was some difference between the various models, especially for video rendering. And I'm going to give the Pro the edge, but it's not a huge practical advantage because I'm only rendering so many videos a week. We also have a new media encoder and personally, I'm not editing multiple 8K video tracks. And if I were, then a better choice would be one of the higher end MacBooks or a Mac Studio. Now, SSD speeds have been another hot topic and check out the difference between the base model with 256 gigabytes of storage, the 512 gigabytes and the one terabyte model. We know that the 256 gigabyte models are actually running two separate 128 gigabyte chips, which lead to slower read and write speeds. But we're also seeing that the one terabyte M2 MacBook Air was faster than the 512 gigabytes M2 Pro. Now, whether this speed will actually be meaningful in your day-to-day -day work really depends on what you plan on doing. For how I use these laptops, I haven't really noticed a difference unless I'm actually running benchmarks. If you plan on doing the type of work that may be impacted by this difference, it's unlikely that you're gonna go with the 256 gigabyte model anyway, but having said that, I think Apple should be more transparent here. If there's going to be a difference between the speeds of the storage options, I think it should be listed on the checkout page next to each storage option. I think it's reasonable to say that the majority of shoppers are going to assume that the only difference is gonna be the actual amount of storage, and they aren't going to expect there to be such a drastic delta in performance. Now, while that may or may not actually impact their buying decision, it would at least allow them to make an informed one. So here's how I would look at this decision. And I have links in the description to all the products that I talked about. The M2 MacBook Pro is slightly more expensive. It has better battery life, a touch bar, and it has an active cooling system for a sustained performance. So if those are a priority for you, it may still be a good option. And again, I would definitely check out the 14 inch MacBook Pro. The M2 MacBook Air gives you the option of getting the exact same chip. It has a larger and better display, outstanding battery life. It's lighter and thinner. It's more comfortable to type on, has a better camera and a better speaker system. And it comes in two new colors, Starlight and Midnight. Personally, I think that the MacBook Air is a better option for most users and those who truly need additional performance would most likely benefit by skipping the 13 inch M2 MacBook Pro and looking at the 14 inch one. Now you should watch this M2 comparison. Click on my face to subscribe. Hopefully this video was helpful. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.